Hello, and thank you for joining us today. We're very pleased to have Professor Diffie with us for this webinar as he guides us through his book, Sun Protection, A Risk Management Approach, and the strategies highlighted that can help control exposure to solar UV radiation. Professor Diffie has been working in the area of sun protection for more than 40 years, and his interests include the measurement of personal sun exposure, its effect in effects in normal and diseased skin and ways to minimize excessive exposure, especially through the use of topical sunscreens. He invented the um, UVA star rating for sunscreens in conjunction with Boots Pharmacy, which remains the world's longest running measure of UVA protection for sunscreens. During the webinar, we welcome your questions, so please use the Q&A facility to send them in at any time during the talk. Professor Diffie will then try to answer as many as he can at the end of the presentation and we will respond to any unanswered questions once the webinar is over. On that note, I shall hand you over to Professor Diffie. Well, thank you, Evie, for that very kind introduction. And as you said, I've been interested in the effects of sunlight on the skin for more than 40 years now. And what fascinates me about the topic is its multidisciplinary pathway. On the journey from sunlight entering the skin to eventually causing clinical effects, a number of sciences are involved that range from climatology, optical physics, photochemistry, cellular and molecular biology, through to dermatology and pathology. And each of these subjects could be the topic of a book in its own right. But what I've tried to do in this book is to dip into the various stages along the journey and attempt to draw them together so that readers can gain an overall picture of how we can enjoy and benefit from our time in the sun, which is very pertinent at the moment. We sit here on a summer's afternoon, uh, whilst at the same time limiting our risks to acceptable levels. When I was thinking about writing this book, I was inspired by a paper written by Haddon in 1980, in which he explored the feasibility of various strategies in controlling exposure to a hazard, which in our case is solar ultraviolet radiation. And so I approached the book with chapters that loosely followed his proposals. And as we see here, the first is uh, reduce the amount of the hazard. And I discuss these in chapters two and three. In chapter four, I define the human impact of the hazard. And in chapter five, look at how we might separate the hazard in space and in time from individuals. Physical and chemical barriers that might separate us from the hazard are looked at in chapters 6 and 7, and that follows chapter 8, where I try to look at how we can make people more resistant to the hazard and maybe begin to counter the damage which has already been done. And in the final chapter, we look at ways of how we can stabilize repair and rehabilitate the damage caused by the hazard. In the opening chapter, I discuss risk management, which can be broadly split into determination and evaluation. Determination involves identifying the hazard and estimating the risk. And this process is principally a scientific activity. Evaluation, on the other hand, looks at how different individuals accept the risk and what steps they might take to avert the risk. And here we're, in, we're engaging in a social rather than scientific activity. I mean, for example, some people really like to get a tan, they know the skin, the sun may be bad for their skin, but the desire to uh, achieve a tan uh, overrides any concern they might have about long-term risks. Our relationship with the sun, I've illustrated in this sketch. Too little sun exposure leads to reduced well-being in terms of low levels of vitamin D that are detrimental to our bone health. And in fact, more recently, low vitamin D levels have been reported to be associated with an increased risk of some cancers, uh, especially colon and breast cancer, as well as autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis. Uh, 
On the other hand, if we get too much sun exposure on a summer day, that can lead that evening to skin that is red, painful, and possibly blistering. And sun exposure over many years leads to skin cancer, the most common human cancer with its associated morbidity and mortality. For the, there was a slight hiccup there with the technicalities. Now, whilst I focus in the book on the detrimental consequences of sun exposure, it is probably worth reminding ourselves that there are benefits to UV radiation. Low levels of vitamin D can lead to rickets. It's a disease of bone deformity, and the link between sun exposure and vitamin D production in our skin was one of the earliest successes of epidemiology demonstrated in the 1880s. Heliotherapy, or healing by exposure to the sun's rays, was popular around the early and mid 20th century when patients were taken out onto hospital balconies to aid their recovery from a whole host of diseases. And even today, patients with a common skin disease, psoriasis, may spend a week or two at places like the Dead Sea in Israel at purpose-built heliotherapy centers. And on the right-hand picture, I illustrate the germicidal effect of solar UV, uh, which is exploited in the sterilization of drinking water. And this uses just a plastic bottle and sunlight. And it is estimated that more than 5 million people disinfect their drinking water in this way. Moving on to chapters two and three, I discuss the many factors that alter both the quality or the spectrum and the quantity or irradiance of UV radiation we receive here on the Earth's surface. The most important factor is solar elevation. The higher the sun in the sky, the greater the UV intensity. Next, we have absorption by atmospheric gases. Notably, of course, ozone. Now, ozone absorption is important for wavelengths in the shortwave UV. It prevents UVC radiation from reaching us here on Earth and attenuates strongly the UVB component. And, of course, it's concern about depletion of the ozone layer and possible increases in UV radiation at the Earth's surface, which has uh, interested uh, atmospheric and health scientists for many decades now. Clouds, well, it's difficult to summarize simply the effects of clouds. Light clouds scattered over a blue sky really make very little difference to UV intensity unless they're directly covering the sun. But if we have complete light cloud cover, this can reduce the UV we get here on Earth to under one half of that from the clear sky. But even with heavy clouds, uh, the diffuse components of sunlight is seldom less than 10% of that under a clear sky. Uh, solar radiation, UV radiation, increases with altitude um, at about 5 to 8% per kilometre above sea level. Uh, most ground surfaces reflect less than 10% of UV. Uh, the main exception is fresh snow, uh, which can reflect up to 80%. Uh, contrary to any much popular belief, uh, reflection from the sea contributes only a few percent to our exposure at the coast. And finally, aerosols and air pollution um, can modify the spectrum and intensity of UV radiation, but only to a relatively small effect. To appreciate how much sunlight we receive here on Earth, we need to measure it. And there are several reasons why we, want, we might want to measure solar UV. For example, we might want to establish a, a climatology, or we might want to detect trends in global UV to see whether ozone depletion is having any effect. Measuring UV uh, enables us to provide data sets for the validation of computational models of UV climatology, 
And lastly, it can provide data for public information and awareness. Um, all of us, I'm sure, have seen the UV index presented on weather forecasts in our respective countries. There are two principal ways to measure UV. Uh, spectra radiometry, illustrated by the left-hand picture, characterizes the intensity received on the Earth's surface as a function of wavelength. And here we see a spectral radiometer operating at the South Pole. The right-hand picture shows a broadband radiometers, which are simpler and cheaper devices, and that usually record the erythemal or sun-burning radiation at a specific site. And this photo shows an intercomparison of 36 broadband radiometers on a roof platform in the Swiss Alps. Many laboratories around the world carry out continuous monitoring of ambient erythemal UV. Although there is a great deal of scatter around this smooth curve due to the many different factors, not least of which is the local weather, the latitude gradient is seen very clearly with increasing annual erythemal UV as locations move closer to the equator. To the right-hand side of the vertical axis, the vertical y-axis, we have different locations in the northern hemisphere, and on the left-hand side we have locations in the southern hemisphere. The effect of altitude in particular is seen in the data from Hawaii, seen here by the arrow, and Greenland, where both these measurement sites are over 3,000 meters above sea level. Also, the South Pole, which is almost 3,000 meters above sea level, um, we see elevated uh, UV, and so its high altitude, combined with the ozone hole, will result in relatively high annual ambient UV radiation. Moving on now to chapter four, I look at the harmful effects of solar UV on the skin. Uh, the skin is uh, composed of largely of three layers. We have an outer layer of dead cells of about 10 microns thick, uh, termed the stratum corneum. Below that is the epidermis, uh, which is between about 30 to 100 microns thick on most uh, body sites, with full thickness skin below that of about one to two millimeters. Now, the commonest effect of UV on the skin, sun's rays on the skin, which I'm sure almost everybody has experienced at some time or other, is sunburn. It appears within a few hours of exposure and can last for a few days, uh, depending on severity of exposure. And it's due mainly to the UVB component of sunlight. Basal and squamous cell skin cancers, which account for nine out of every 10 skin cancers, um, occur in the epidermis. Basal cell cancers are about four times more prevalent than squamous cell cancers. And skin cancer is by far the most common cancer diagnosed in uh, Western countries. But the most serious form of skin cancer is malignant melanoma, and this constitutes about 10% of all skin cancers. Although 90% of people who do develop malignant melanoma can expect to live for 10 years or more. The incidence is continuing to rise in many countries, and for example in the UK it's doubling every 15 years or so. What's unusual about melanoma is it tends to occur at younger ages than many other cancers. And so an individual who dies from melanoma loses on average about 20 years of potential life compared to an average of 16 years for all malignant cancers. And finally, we have photoaging, which is characterized by fine and coarse wrinkling of the skin, uh, mottled pigmentation, loss of elasticity, sagging, and uh, pre-malignant changes uh, known as actinic keratoses. And most of these clinical changes are caused by alterations in the dermis. 
we're not all at risk, same risk of these effects. Um, and we can classify people into what are called sun-reactive skin types. There are six different sun-reactive skin types illustrated by the uh, picture at the top of the slide here. Uh, skin type 1 people are those with uh, often ginger hair and freckles and pale skin. They always burn easily and severely, and they will tan hardly at all, um, and generally always peel if they get a bad sunburn. And then we move out up through the different skin types until we reach skin types five or six. And these are people with naturally pigmented skin who will rarely burn, um, tan very easily, um, and uh, are most resistant to the harmful effects um, of the sun. So why do we think the sun causes skin cancer? Well, there are racial differences, melanoma and squamous cell cancer are about 20 times more common in people with white skin compared with those with black skin. And for basal cell carcinoma, there's a 60-fold difference. As I've just said, the phenotype is important. Genetic factors associated with a tendency to develop skin cancer are light eyes, fair complexion, light hair color, a tendency to sunburn, and a poor ability to tan. In other words, the risk of skin cancer decreases as the phototype increases. Anatomical distribution. Frequently exposed body sites, such as the head and the neck, are the commonest sites for both basal and squamous cell cancers. In contrast, melanoma occurs relatively more frequently on the trunk and legs at sites which are not, certainly the trunk, not habitually exposed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. People living in sunny countries, such as Australia, have a much greater risk of developing skin cancer than people with similar genetic backgrounds who live in much less sunny climates, such as the UK. For example, about two out of every three people living in Australia can expect to develop at least one skin cancer uh, during their lifetime. Uh, the corresponding figure for the UK, on the other hand, is about one in ten people will develop skin cancer. People who are born in Europe and who migrate to a sunny country like Australia after childhood have a risk of developing skin cancer, which is about one quarter of that of people of European descent born in Australia. But if you arrive during childhood, before the age of 10, you can expect a similar risk as native-born Australians. Perhaps not surprisingly, people who work outdoors are more likely to develop basal and squamous cell skin cancers than indoor workers. Again, melanoma is different in that it is more common in professional indoor workers than in those who work outdoors. And it may be that wealthier people are more likely to travel to sunny climates several times a year and so experience bursts of high sun exposure on skin that is covered up for much of the year, such as the trunk. And lastly, there's what's termed the intermittent exposure hypothesis. Although the evidence indicates an association between melanoma and sunlight exposure, it doesn't appear that cumulative sun exposure over many years explains the relationship as it does for basal and squamous cell cancers. Instead, we think that intermittent high-intensity sun exposure from recreational activities, such as sunbathing on a beach somewhere, is a critical factor in malignant melanoma, especially if several studies have shown that a history of sunburn, which occurs most often on holiday, um, is an important risk factor for melanoma development. And finally, we should also remember that there are non-solar risk factors for skin cancer. For example, Patients who have undergone organ transplantation and are given drugs to suppress their immune system are at greater risk of skin cancers, especially squamous cell cancer, where the increased risk can be a hundredfold or greater. And people infected with the HIV virus have something like a twofold increase in the risk of skin cancer compared with a non-infected control group. 
So moving on to chapter five, we look at how time and place can be used as modifiers or can be exploited as modifiers of our personal UV exposure. We need to start, though, by looking at what sort of sun exposure we get. Broadly speaking, we can divide our sun exposure into adventitious exposure, by which I mean the unavoidable exposure associated with everyday activities, such as shopping and traveling to work, where exposed sites are normally limited to the face and hands. Elective exposure, on the other hand, occurs when we deliberately go to seek the sun for recreational purposes, usually during summer weekends and holidays. During our elective exposure, we often expose our arms, legs, and sometimes our trunk, or even whole body. Now, to understand just how much solar UV radiation we receive, we need to measure it using personal dosimeters. These could be either uh, a small detector linked to a data logger, shown by the upper picture, or a UV-sensitive film that responds to the same wavelengths in sunlight that cause sunburn. And the lower picture shows a UV-sensitive film uh, pinned to someone's jacket. Alternatively, we can construct mathematical models of varying complexity to estimate typical UV exposures of different populations. The graph shows the results of a measurement study carried out in Denmark on 164 uh, children and adults. Note that the vertical axis is logarithmic, logarithmic and so there's a very wide range in annual doses between individuals, reflecting the large propensity for different individuals spending time out of doors. And the gray shaded area is uh, an estimate of modeled um, pop average population exposure for Denmark, uh, which, tend which agrees well with the median um, measured doses illustrated by the solid horizontal line. How have attitudes and trends in sun exposure been changing? Well, this graph shows the changing holiday patterns um, of uh, British people over the last, uh, what, 40 odd years. And you can see there really is a steady upward trend um, with a dip in 2008, which um, was believed to be caused by the economic recession at the time. Although you see that uh, the, the curve is now starting to uh, rise sharply again. So holiday exposure tends to be, uh, abroad tends to be, certainly for UK people, to sunnier climates. And so as a whole, our population sun exposure um, looks like it's been increasing now for several decades. There are community strategies for controlling our sun exposure. Educating people in schools, the meteorological services provide us with the UV index. Cancer organizations and healthcare professionals provide uh, information and leaflets. And lastly, the media has a role to play with articles in magazines and newspapers. And the poster on the left is what's known as Sid the Seagull. It's been around for many years now and was uh, produced by the Anti-Cancer Council in Victoria um, in Australia. And the messages here are slop on some sunscreen, slip on a shirt, uh, slap on a hat, slide on some sunglasses, and seek shade. So these five uh, messages, all beginning with S, are the cornerstones of good sun protection. And then there are strategies we could adopt ourselves for um, controlling our sun exposure. Um, we can uh, limit our sun exposure around the middle of the day, choose where we want to go and when to take our holidays, and we can use the UV index to help guide us. Now, this graph here shows the cumulative UV um, during the course of a sunny day um, on a summer's day in southern Europe. And you see that from sunrise, uh, the, the UV, the cumulative UV rises, 
until we get to the evening when it starts to plateau. And here is a similar curve for Scotland, which, not surprisingly, um, has the same shape, but plateaus at a lower amplitude. But a siesta is uh, it's popular in hot Mediterranean countries, and taking a three-hour siesta at noon actually results in a lower uh, cumulative daily dose than uh, on the Mediterranean than it would do for our all-day exposure in Edinburgh. And this is illustrated by the bottom curve here. And so the line goes horizontal for two hours before solar noon, um, which in, uh, in the Mediterranean countries will be around midday to about three o'clock in the afternoon. So someone is inside having a nap or whatever, um, with getting no sun exposure. So by the end of the day, they've had less sun exposure um, than someone in Scotland. There are physical barriers that we can use to protect ourselves from uh, solar radiation, UV radiation. The first, of course, is shade. Now, when we are outside in the summer, we receive roughly half of our UV exposure directly from the sun and a half scattered from the sky. Shading our skin from just direct sunlight will give us really very low protection, equivalent to using a sunscreen of about SPF2. So for better protection, it's also vital to ensure that we are blocking as much of the sky as possible. Um, on the right-hand side here is a, a picture of a, a school in New Zealand where they're using uh, natural vegetation as a means of uh, shade um, to protect the children who are uh, having a lesson um, out of doors. Clothing is another physical barrier. Um, there are a number of factors which affect the sun protection we achieve from clothing. Uh, these can include uh, weave, the type of fabric, whether it's uh, man-made or natural fabric, its color, its thickness, whether it's wet or dry, and how many times it's been laundered. But by far, the most important factor is the weave, or how tightly the fibers are knitted or woven together. You can think of the weave of a fabric as a wire mesh fence, and the small of the holes, and the sun's rays is maybe uh, balls being thrown against the fence. And the smaller the holes, the less the number of balls are going to go through. And so what we need to choose, ideally, with a fabric, is one which is tightly woven. Now, in Australia, they've developed a methodology for measuring the protection factor of fabrics. It's called the ultraviolet protection factor, or UPF. And this photograph here is taken in a sports shop in, in Australia and shows, um, as well as the price ticket hanging from the uh, T-shirt, the uh, a tag is in indicating that this particular T-shirt has a UV, a, a UV protection factor of 50 plus. And then there are optical filters. Uh, these are either usually glass or plastic, such as polycarbonate. And we find these in canopies and conservatories. Um, in car windscreens and side windows, um, and in sunglasses. So that's physical barriers. Uh, in chapter seven, I look at chemical barriers, and really the chemical barrier that we put on our skin um, is sunscreens. Now, sunscreens can take many forms, including creams, it can be milks, lotions, gels, foams, oils, ointments, and sprays. The active ingredients for sunscreen are known as the UV filters. And sunscreens normally contain oh, four or five UV filters that are a mixture of both organic and inorganic chemicals. The first use of sunscreen was reported in 1928. And then they were intended not so much to protect the skin from harm, but to encourage tanning by reducing the risk of burning. Studies show that about one-third of people claim to use sunscreens uh, with the most prevalent use, uh, not surprisingly, in children. Now, the best-known metric for expressing the effectiveness of a sunscreen is the sun protection factor, or SPF. Generally, SPFs in practice are less than those measured in the lab uh, due to a combination of user factors, such as 
in general, people apply much less sunscreen on a beach than the manufacturers will use in a lab, and how well it's spread. And technical factors to do with the difference between the spectrum of UV lamps in the testing process and natural sunlight. Other topics that I cover in this chapter are whether sunscreens need to protect us against infrared radiation and do they compromise our vitamin D production. And finally, I look at the evidence of whether sunscreens prevent skin cancer. Now, there are some data to indicate that they do have a role in preventing skin cancer, but there's not the strength of evidence as we would expect before a new drug was introduced as a treatment. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't be using sunscreen. Just because we don't have sufficient evidence doesn't necessarily mean that they're not effective. And of course, theoretically, we would expect them to be as sunscreens absorb UV, and UV is a well-established risk factor for skin cancer. Anyway, moving on, once we've been exposed to the sun's UV rays, damage to vulnerable skin cells that lead to acute or chronic clinical changes will follow. Now, the skin incorporates ways of damage limitation, either by adapting itself to reduce subsequent damage or by initiating cellular processes to repair the damage that has occurred. Well, the protective mechanism we're all familiar with is tanning, uh, which becomes noticeable about two to four days after sun exposure, gradually increases for several days, and can persist for weeks or months. As summer becomes a distant memory and our UV exposure diminishes, the tan skin fades. And our ability to develop a tan is very much determined by our skin type. So people with skin type 1 won't or hardly will develop a tan, whereas those with skin types 3 and 4, although they're white-skinned uh, people, will tan readily. Now, in addition to tanning, the skin is capable of epidermal thickening or hyperplasia, which begins to occur around three days after exposure. In white skin, thickening is probably more important than tanning in providing natural photoprotection, although in darkly pigmented races, it's likely that skin pigmentation is the most important means of protection against solar UV. Now, DNA damage occurs spontaneously following UV exposure, and our cells have developed repair mechanisms to remove the damage. Uh, these are excision repair and post-replication repair. But these mechanisms are not always effective, and when this happens, skin cancer may be the end result. At its most extreme, the damage may be too great for the cell, either because of its magnitude or because it blocks a vital process, and the cell will die in a well-controlled way known as apoptosis. And finally, what happens when we've reached the stage where we really need to try to treat the damage caused by too much sunlight. Well, for sunburn, for mild sunburn, a cooling lotion such as calamine or an after, after sun cream can be applied. Mild to moderate sunburn will resolve after a few days, even if it's not treated. Um, although in severe cases of sunburn, this may be accompanied by pain and blistering, and healing will take longer. The skin cancer, the treatment of choice for skin cancers, and this is especially true of melanoma, is surgery. Um, other techniques that can be used for basal and squamal cell cancers include a curettage and diathermy, which involves scraping away the tumor with an instrument called a curette, after which the wound is allowed to heal from the base up, in much the same way as a graze on the knee may heal following um, mild trauma. Cryotherapy destroys the tissue of the skin cancer due to formation of ice crystals that have been exposed to liquid nitrogen. And again, it's best suited to fairly superficial uh, skin cancers and some type of actinic keratoses. There are some topical creams that can be used. Uh, in the UK, we have a cream, the most widely prescribed cream for uh, actinic keratoses is called Effudix. Uh, 
or in more severe cases, uh, photodynamic therapy can be used. And this involves the photoactivation of a tissue localized photosensor, uh, notably, um, oh, this is like escaping my mind at the moment. Um, Mohs micrographic surgery is a specialist type of skin surgery used when skin cancer is spread beyond its visible margins. And it can be useful on sites such as the nose or close to the eyes, um, where the margin of the tumor is difficult to destroy, uh, it's difficult to define um, clinically. And finally, radiotherapy is rarely used uh, these days, um, but uh, it's mainly limited to the treatment of um, aggressive uh, uh, squamous cell carcinomas. Well, I've just remembered this tissue localized photosensitizer are mainly porphyrin agents. I should have known that. It's uh, I've slipped my memory. And finally, we move on to photoaging. And this, of course, occurs as the result of chronic sun exposure. But the extent and the consequences of these changes vary greatly among individuals. The decision about whether to seek treatment for photoaged skin uh, depends on the nature of the changes, their severity, the degree to which they impact on someone's self-image, and their willingness to accept the risks and certainly the costs of the treatment. Now, the treatment could be topical preparations, it can be minimally invasive procedures, or invasive surgery. Uh, and you see here with minimally invasive uh, procedures, there's a lot now which are available lasers, radiofrequency radiation, intense pulse light, uh, dermabrasion, which is a procedure that uses a rapidly rotating device to resurface the epidermis. Um, Botox injections, uh, dermal fillers, which are injections to fill out the wrinkles and creases in the skin, and chemical peels, um, which uh, produce uh, exfoliation removal um, of the epidermis. And in, uh, if none of those work, then all that can be left uh, is invasive surgery, which is uh, commonly known as uh, a facelift. And so there we have it, a risk management approach to sun protection. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, um, Professor Diffie. That was really interesting. Um, we've had a few questions come in during your presentation, so I'll just start by, I'll just start going through them for you, okay? Um, the first one we had was um, on the wavelength. Um, it, the question is, what wavelength range is dangerous for human skin? Is it only UV? Well, certainly um, UV radiation is by far the, the wave band which causes the most, um, the most harm, as I explained here in terms of acute effects like sunburn and chronic effects like skin cancer. Um, in recent years, there's been some concern about whether infrared radiation um, on the uh, skin may have some harmful effects. And certainly, in the um, laboratory, one can demonstrate cellular changes uh, with um, infrared radiation. The point is, though, it's one thing demonstrating it in a, in a dish in the laboratory, and it's another thing in the context of human behavior out of doors. And at the moment, I think the, uh, the jury is out on whether protection in sunscreens, for example, against infrared radiation really is necessary or whether it's more to do with marketing than a real health benefit. Okay, thank you. The next question we have um, is, can you briefly explain what is meant by risk management approach to sun protection? Well, yes, uh, I, I tried to do that early on in the talk. And um, when we think about risk management, of course, the first thing we've got to do, I think, is to identify the hazard that we wish to manage. Um, and in our case, of course, it's solar UV radiation. And so having identified the hazard, we then need to think about how we might limit our exposure to the hazard. Can we prevent or reduce it? Can we avoid the hazard in space and time? I mean, a silly example that comes to mind is that only to go outside at night uh, <laughs> will avoid the hazard. Yeah. Can we use physical and chemical barriers? Can we make ourselves more resistant to the hazard? And finally, 
when all else fails, can we repair the damage? And those, I think, are the steps in a risk management approach to sun protection. Okay. Um, somebody's asked that it, they, it seems that the sun rays are indeed getting stronger. Is, are you possible? Are you able to explain this? Well, well actually, I think that's that's a misperception. Um, since if we look at the results of um, ground-based UV monitoring, uh, it's carried out in many sites now around the world, these haven't shown any statistically significant long-term upward trends. I mean, there are uh, clearly year-to-year -year, uh, variations due largely to, to changes in the weather from year to year. But at the moment, we're not seeing any um, convincing upward trends in uh, UV radiation at the Earth's surface. So I think they, it may seem that they're getting stronger, uh, mm. but they're not. They're not. OK. When um, choosing SPF, what SPF should I choose when I buy a sunscreen? Um, well, I guess first of all, you've got to ask yourself, why are you using sunscreen? And I guess for most people, the answer is they want to prevent sunburn from enjoying when they go out to enjoy the sun. Um, so you need to, if you go back to first principles, you need to then to start by asking what SPF would stop you getting sunburned? Well, if we need to consider three things, we need to consider the ambient levels of UV throughout a clear, sunny day. How sensitive your skin is to sunlight, whether you're skin type 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 and so on, and what you may be planning to do, because if you're lying horizontal on a beach, you're going to get much more sun exposure during a given time than if you're upright um, walking, sightseeing around a city. Anyway, by taking those three factors into account, we can calculate that for most people with white skin, an SPF 15 should protect you from sunbathing all day on the beach on the Mediterranean. But, and here we find there's a mismatch because many people who use an SPF 15 report that they're getting, about getting sunburnt. And the reason is that this mismatch is between how much sunscreen manufacturers use during the testing process and how uniformly they spread it, compared with a typical application on a beach where we don't see many people getting out the scales to weigh it and no. applying it smoothly with a glove finger. So to answer the question, I would recommend an SPF 30 if you plan to spend several hours in unshaded, strong sunshine. Because although theoretically a 15 will uh, uh, satisfy the needs, because of the, the way that sunscreen is applied and used, you need to compensate for the under application by using a a higher than you might think necessary labelled SPF, because a sunscreen labelled SPF will deliver you something like between an SPF 10 to 15 in practice. Okay, I think we've got time for very quick for one last question, and that is um, on the star rating on the sunscreens. If you if you could quickly just summarise what those actually represent. Right. Well, when you pick up a bottle of sunscreen, the first thing you see is the SPF rating on the front. But if you turn the bottle over, and on the back is the star rating, which can range from anything to one to five stars. Now, to understand this, we need to go back to first principles. What we do know is that by reducing the intensity or strength of the sun's UV rays on our skin, we reduce the likelihood of damaging our skin, either by getting sunburn that day or getting skin cancer later in life. And nature understands the importance of this, so that when we seek natural shade by stepping under a tree or wearing clothing to protect our skin, we reduce the overall strength of the sun's UVB and UVA rays almost equally. In other words, nature is providing us with balanced protection against both UVB and UVA. And that's just what we would like to achieve when we apply a sunscreen to our skin. So how do we know if we're getting balanced protection? Well, that's where the star rating comes in. The higher the number of stars, the more balanced the protection. Okay, that, that is all we've got time for, I'm afraid. But thank you ever so much for, for joining us, everybody, and thank you, Professor Diffie, for your presentation, um, which will be available on demand 24 hours after this event. Thank you, and goodbye.